So, um, so, so yeah, so uh, when you maybe think about art and math, uh, I mean, what do they have to do with each other? I mean, in some sense, they, it seems like they're quite different from each other. Um, and so uh, I thought I'd say a couple of words about, about that at, at the start, and then the rest of the, the, the talk is, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of pretty pictures and explain a little bit about what's going on, and then move on quickly to something else. So, um, so yeah, so uh, let's start with a little bit of mathematics. So this is the kind of stuff that my math looks like, right? So, so um, lots of pictures and, you know, there's a few numbers here and there, but it's mostly, you know, visual things. How are these things interacting in space? And so maybe you'd think that that's some connection between mathematics and art and that they're both visual, or they can be visual uh, kinds of things. But I think there's a much stronger connection, which is much broader uh, on the mathematical side, which is that both mathematicians and artists are allowed to ask what if questions. So if you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, whatever you're doing, eventually, it's got to get back to the real world, right? The bridge is not, not going to fall down. The experiment has got to be successful. But as mathematicians, we're allowed to just like imagine, like, what if the world was this way? What would the consequences be? And artists have the same freedom. And so, you know, it, it, we go off into the wilderness and we, you know, see what happens if things are set up this way. And maybe something comes back that's useful and maybe not. And, uh, but it's okay if nothing comes back that's useful. Most of, our, most of us spend our entire careers doing things that ultimately are maybe not very useful, at least not in our lifetimes. Um, so, so with that, um, I think I'll transition to talking about um, my work. And this is sort of a good transition slide. Uh, so, well, what is this thing here? This is a photograph of a 3D print. Um, and what are you supposed to, uh, how are you supposed to interpret this, right? It's sort of like a kind of like a wireframe skeleton or something. But we were, what you're supposed to imagine is that you've got a ball of dough and you have a very well-trained worm that eats a tunnel, a knotted tunnel through this ball of dough. And so, you know, it goes in here and then it goes around here and it comes out here. And so what is that object? It's a three-dimensional blob of stuff with a certain topology. Uh, this is the complement of the figure eight knots, which is this hugely important example in three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So this is really closely connected to the work that I do sort of as a, as a in my day job, let's say, <laughs> let's put it that way. That's what I was hired to do. I mean, Oklahoma State are very nice. They let me do all this other weird stuff, but they, I was hired to be a topologist. And, um, and I won't always mention their names, but um, I'll always put my collaborators on whatever project it was somewhere, somewhere on the slide, so you'll see it there. So, so I'm a topologist, and as everybody, everybody knows, the topologist can't tell the difference between a coffee mug and a, and a donut. And, uh, you know, so here's this sort of like deformation from, from one to the other. And the sort of mathematically interesting question with, okay, you know, here's this thing made real out of real porcelain, you know, uh, you, you can 3D print in all kinds of weird materials and various different processes, so this, this is in porcelain. So the real mathematical question is, where do these shapes come from, right? So topology is all well and good, but if you have to print it, you have to come up with real geometry, right? You have to tell the computer where to put porcelain and where to put not porcelain. And so the real work there is by Keenan Crane, who's uh, in computer science at Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, and he's, uh, he's using something called conformal Wilmore flow in order to, to do this, this modification, which I don't understand. I just, my only contribution to this was to sort of clean it up a little bit and make it 3D principle. Um, and, and you can sort of see, I mean, if I point it out, right, this is a very chunky handle for a coffee mug, right? Why is it that chunky? He, so, so Keenan designed this coffee mug, and he had to do it that way. If, it, if the handle was sort of thin in the way that you would expect a coffee mug to be, you wouldn't end up with the symmetrical torus at the end. It would be distorted in some way. So, so there were some constraints in, in, in the process there. Here's another famous uh, topological object. This is a knot. Um, this knot has the interesting property that it will roll along the table. So the, the property here is called... Uh, uh, this knot has no tritangent planes. There are no planes you can put up against the knot which are tangent to the knot in three places. And uh, there was a paper in the 90s that described this particular configuration. This is actually the trefoil, trefoil knot. And as far as I know, that's the only known example. So if you, if you happen to know of an example where, you know, a, a way to tie a knot so that there's no way to put a plane against it that's tangent in three places, if it were, you would have a triangle and it would be stable on the floor. But yes, if, if you happen to come up with one, I'd love to know it so we can make more rolling knots like this. 
Um, here's a larger rolling object. Um, so, so this is a big metal sculpture. Um, or I guess, really, it's what it is. It's a it's a circus apparatus. So, so Lee Braswell is in the Department of Theatre at Oklahoma State, and uh, I got talking to him at one of these, you know, faculty, you know, early faculty meet and greet kind of things, which are. I always thought these were useless things, but I got to meet this guy who's into circus rigging and theater and, and so on. And we are talking about rolling objects. And so we ended up designing this, this big metal thing here. I'm not an acrobat, so I won't show you what you, know, you can do with this. This guy, Chris Delgado, is. So here's what it does. Uh, this, on the, the, this is you know, how you would imagine to see it. This is the view from there's a camera that's attached to the frame. It's going to reset in a second. Right Here backwards. we go. Yep. Yeah, so there you can see that's the, that's the view from over here. Anyway, so what is this doing? So there's a class of circus uh, apparatus where you get in a big metal frame and you roll around on the stage. Right and most of the, they're sort of like, they're just wheels, right? They just go straight. And there was some sort of zigzag back and forth across the stage. And so the, the sort of problem, the question here was, can you design a circus right apparatus where there are choices, where at certain points in the movement, you can lean one way or the other and go off along a different path. So this will actually roll in a straight line, but there's also particular places where you can sort of change lanes. And uh, let's see. So here he's rolling along this way, and then here he changes lanes. He could have gone straight forward, and then he's going forward again, and again he changes lanes again. So there's, so I wrote a paper in the notices about like what are the you know what are the constraints? What can you get away with? How can you uh, how can you design these things? Um, okay, so here's another rolling object. Um, I worked very hard at that transition transition between different subjects, so I hope you appreciated it. Um, so dice. Um, I should start handing some of these things around. Nobody's on the front row, so I'm just gonna. Uh, good catch. Uh, so. So we were the first to mass produce a 120-sided die. So this is sort of about as many sides as you can realistically do for a usable die. Um, you need some symmetry properties for the die to be fair. You need that every face is the same as it will. Really, you need the, um, the symmetry group to be transitive on faces. That means that every face is sort of as, as likely to, or it's unbiased, right? You're not going to favor one kind of face over another if they're all the same. Um, so that's one part of it. The, the other sort of really interesting mathematical question here is the numbering. So uh, if you've looked at a six-sided die recently, maybe you've noticed that opposite sides add to seven, right? Does anybody know why? Why is it on a six-sided die that you have one opposite six and two opposite five and three opposite four? It's sort of not obvious, right? And, and actually, I don't think there's a... Um, I don't think the history is really there to have a definitive answer, but at least here's one sort of story for why you put one opposite six and two opposite five. And what that does is it means that the average of two faces on opposite sides is the same. So one of the ways in which a die can be unfair is that if it's sort of squished down a little bit, it's more like a coin. And then the big faces are going to be more likely to come up than the faces around the sides. And that can be really imperceptible, but it can make a big difference to the percentage chances. So. So yeah, so this is sort of like a balancing, right? If the die is unfair, it's not perfectly geometric, at least you still have the average, you're not rolling high, you're not rolling low. So another way you could try and do this, right? I mean, okay, so sure, opposite 120 is one, you can check it on the die going around, but that doesn't cut the possibilities down very much. So we also wanted to sort of like balance the numbers out, right? It wouldn't be any good if like all of the big numbers were sort of over here and all the small numbers were on the other side, maybe you could cheat. So the thing that we, well, the, the balancing that we decided to go for is that the sum of the numbers around every vertex on the entire die, the average is the same. So the sum around all of the vertices degree 10 is the same. The sum of the, uh, around all the vertices degree 6 is the same, and the sum around all of the vertices degree 4 is the same. And so this is not easy to find. So we, uh, I should say, I mean, uh, Robert Fathauer and I have been working on making these dice for, for many, many years. And we enlisted Bob Bosch, who's in operations research at Oberlin College, to, who, and he saw, oh yeah, this is a linear, integer linear program, yeah, integer linear programming problem, so you can start using you know, software to try and sort this out. 
And we found one solution after you know, a month of computer time, and we were pretty lucky to, to find it. Um, since then, um, uh, there's a, uh, a Paul McGuire is another guy who, who got interested in this question, has been using genetic algorithms to find solutions. And I think the number is in the trillions now of different ways to number the 120-sided die with all of these balancing properties. But we still, I mean, this, he's using genetic algorithms. We still don't have like a real understanding of what the shape of the set of solutions looks like or how many there are. It's a very, very large space to, to try and explore. So there's an open question for you. Um, here are some other weird dice. Do I have these out here? I think I do. Um, maybe I'll start some dice over, over this side. So these are six-sided dice, and the, the obvious question that comes up is, can these possibly be fair, right? Um, well, uh, that's those three of the sides, and if I hold it this way, you can see that they're the same shape. And if I turn it around, you can see that the other three are also the same shape. So this has that transitivity property. So even though this looks like a, you know, whoops, this looks, Dubious, right? You you're going to show up to Vegas with these? I think that's a bad idea. Please don't. Um, but at least theoretically, they should be just as fair as cubicle dice, right? There's, there's no difference. Um, and yeah, so here's, here's the same version with 12-sided dice, which is somehow less impressive, I think. Um, these are sort of skewed in, in some way, like this, this is not a regular pentagon. Uh, but I think it's less impressive because People don't really know what dodecahedra will look like in any, any way. Like, people know what cubes look like, but this is just too complicated a shape anyway, so who, who knows? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so we went, we carried on down this sort of skewing uh, direction, and of course we ended up having to do a full set of the seven Dungeons and Dragons dice. You have the, the four-sided die, which we, we think is just an improvement on the usual four-sided. How many people know the, the usual four-sided die? few people, it's just a regular tetrahedron, right? And it's sort of like, well, there's no face on top. How do you read it? Uh, anyway, so there's the six-sided, the eight-sided. Uh, tens are a little bit weird. There's the 12. The 20 is a really interesting case. There is nothing you can do to modify the icosahedron in a small way and still retain the face transitivity property. And so the only thing you can do is go to this monstrosity of like, it's two 10-sided pyramids stuck together. And uh, yeah, so it's the most cursed 20-sided die you'll ever see. Um, talking of symmetry, uh, this is a project with my brother. It's called More Fun Than a Hypercube of Monkeys. So there are eight monkeys here, um, and they don't look the same as each other, but that's because we're only able to see a three-dimensional shadow of the true four-dimensional sculpture. So in four dimensions, all of these monkeys are the same, and you know, there's this ring here and this ring here, and each monkey is standing on the head of the previous monkey. Um, and, and yes, in, in four dimensions, they're all the same. It's just the distortion that sort of produces this kind of somewhat disturbing uh, Dali-esque thing going on here. So this is based on the geometry of the hypercube. So of course, there are other four-dimensional polytopes. So here's the version based on the 24 cell, and here's the version based on the 120 cell, and here's the uh, virtual reality version. So if you go to monkeys.hypernom.com, then you will see this. And, uh, whoops, here we go. So you can sort of fly around, and, uh, and once upon a time you could, you could interact with it in VR, but I don't know if that works anymore. Things tend to break. Um, but yeah, so it's showing the symmetry, right? Every few seconds this monkey turns into this one, and that's one of the symmetries of the, of the hypercube. And the same thing with the other, there's another eight monkeys going, sorry, four monkeys going upwards. So this is the, the ones based on the 24 cell. It turns out that the 24 cell is self-dual. So you can fit another copy of the sculpture in the gaps left in between the, uh, the monkeys of the first sculpture. And uh, yeah, this is the full sort of uh, 24 cell of monkeys, uh, sorry, the 120 cell of monkeys. So, and again, Every few seconds, one monkey is turning into the next monkey, and that's, that's one of the symmetries of, of this four-dimensional sculpture. Okay. So, let's see. So I wanted to, to maybe say a little bit about um, what makes a good visualization. Um, let's see. And 
And so I wanted to illustrate this with, with, uh, with a, an example. Now I'm going to see if this is going to work. I didn't try this out before. Maybe I should have done. So um, what I was hoping to do was to sort of cast a shadow against the back. But it's really bright, so I think that may not work. OK, so well, I've got this plastic sphere, and I've got a flashlight. And uh, if you put them together in the right way, it looks like this. There we go. Um, <laughs> Best I can do. Um, so, so, so what's going on here, you've got this sort of uh, curvy grid on the sphere, and this light is casting this shadow, right, of the, the straight lines, the straight grid on the plane. So, well, okay, first of all, what is this illustrating? This is illustrating stereographic projection, right, the map from the sphere to the plane. And, I mean, how does it do it? Well, you... Uh, take the north pole of the sphere and you cast a ray down inside of the sphere and it hits the sphere somewhere and that ray continues on to hit the plane somewhere. And that's the map, right? Where does it hit on the sphere? Where does it hit on the plane? Of course, you can write down a, an equation, right? There's a formula. It's not even a very complicated formula. It's like x comma y divided by 1 minus z or something like that. But you don't need to know the formula to understand what's going on. So, I mean, so that's one way, one way in which, like, a visualization, if it tells you something without having to go into the, um, uh, the, the equations, the formulas, if you just see it, then, you know, that, that's a good thing. Um, of course, it's, it's accurate, right? This is really doing stereographic projection. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? There's something um, about the medium that you choose to illustrate something in. Right? I mean, lots of you will be, you know, writing figures or generating figures in your, in your uh, article, and of course that's the appropriate way to do it, but if you're communicating to a broader audience, it matters what you're doing, right? So I could have made this as a computer render, right, rather than, okay, it's, it's a photograph. I would have shown you for real, but anyway, believe me that it works, you can try it out later. Uh, but the fact that it's a physical piece of plastic and a flashlight, there's no cheating, right? I mean, I think people are rightly suspicious of computer-generated imagery. You can do anything, right? But this is a real thing that's happening with objects that you think you understand, the, the, the flashlight and the, the, the piece of plastic. Let's see, um, the last thing to say about this, so uh, if you move this light just a little bit, it's very sensitive, like the shadow is very sensitive to the position of the light at the top. So this is not such an easy photograph to take. Um, in fact, what's going on here, the, real, the way this photograph is taken, the flashlight is taped to a bar and there's a cross beam going across the top, and there are clamp stands either side, and the hand is purely decorative. It's just sitting there trying not to move the flashlight, because if it does, then you know, the shadow gets out of line. Um, so why is the hand there at all? It's to prove that it's not a computer render, or at least when I took the photograph 10 years ago, it would be more plausible that it's not just a computer render. Now it's, you know, now it's harder to, who knows what they can do with, uh, with computers these days. So, um, Variations of this, um, so these are different, uh, so different shadows come from the same sort of bowl-shaped 3D print that illustrate different models of the hyperbolic plane. So uh, here I've got this, this hemisphere and the light is uh, at, the northern, at the north pole of this hemisphere and that produces the Poincaré disk model of H2. If you raise the light all the way up and so that the rays of light are coming down uh, parallel to each other, then you get the Klein model. And if you put the light on the equator of the sphere, you get the upper half plane model. And so all of these different models are related in this, in this way. Um, what, let's see, what are some other? I think we thought about the hyperboloid model, but it's a little trickier to, you'd need a, like a hyperboloid screen to project it onto. So anyway, you get three out of however many different models of, of the hyperbolic plane you want. Uh, we did an exhibition in uh, 2017 in, in Edinburgh. Um, so this one, it was open to the public for like three weeks. Um, so this one, we had the, the globe sort of sitting on a plinth and you could rotate it around. So you would get a different, uh, you know, view of the, the world stereographically projected onto the wall. Um, here we've got sort of, I guess, Edinburgh is, is in the middle because that's where we were. Um, this was a sort of four meter tall version of the grid. Um, we had a room with all kinds of different tilings of the sphere and these were all interactive. You could move things out and move the light around or rotate things. And then uh, this was the sort of the, 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 the finale of that exhibition was, uh, was this, which is a, a zoetrope. So 
Um, so zoetropes, um, maybe you've, you've seen this kind of thing. Um, you have like a, it's this sort of old timey first version of movies. You have like a cylinder with slits caught in it and the cylinder spins around. And you look through the slit to the other side and you see pictures and persistence of vision makes a, an animated thing going on. So this is a super modern version of this. There are uh, 30 different 3D prints that are attached to a, a disc. It's about a meter across and it's spinning around once a second. And 30 times a second, there's a strobe going off which is lighting up this in the right place and you're seeing the, the animation. So what is, it, what is it showing? It's a rotation of a hypercube. It's actually very similar to what the monkeys were doing in, in the, the previous slides. Um, and mathematically, I mean, the most difficult thing here is, uh, is the legs to hold this thing up, right? You can't have your 3D printers floating in midair. It needs to be held up somehow. But because it's rotating, the things that you can attach to the base keep moving away. And so you have to you know, come up with, with ways to reattach them and, and have things jumping around. So you have this messy real world that makes the mathematics more difficult. Okay, so, um, so let's transition uh, once more. So, so this is not really, like the plastic is not really distorting this way. This is an illusion, right? It looks like it's moving, but actually it's not. And so let's go to something that looks like it should move, but actually it doesn't. So, um, so I grew up in Manchester. This is like a, a bus shelter um, uh, advertisement. And I think the idea is that there were three different sort of transportation systems that were gonna come together and make the city work well. And if you look at this for a second, you'll realize there's a problem. So if, say, one is going this way, because of the teeth here, if one is going this way, that means two is going this way, and three can't go in any direction at all. And over here, the teachers, the students, and the parents come together, and no progress is possible, right? Everything's just frozen. Um, this is from an elementary school, I think at the university level. You replace the parents with the administration, and then I think it's perfectly accurate. <laughs> so there's a challenge here. Can you come up with three gears which pairwise mesh into each other, but they do work, that they, they're not frozen. And so this is the first one that we came up with, um, which is uh, kind of complicated, um, as is often the case, right? You, the first idea you come up with to solve a problem is way too complicated, and you come up with something, something simpler later. But let me try and explain what's going on here. There are actually three different rings that are linked through each other um, in this sort of topologically confusing way. Yeah, let me switch to this. This is the sort of animation that shows it. Let's see, uh, here it is. So, um, so, so this has a, actually has a, an extra part, a fourth part. There's a vertical kind of helical shaft that's powering it. This was for an art exhibition, so there was a motor in the base. This is the same thing, except that because um, screw motion, rotation, translation is sort of the same thing, you can just sort of uh, let it run down the, the, uh, the shaft to, to get it to go. Um, but this solves the problem, I mean, in principle. We're, way, we're not in the plane anymore. I don't know if it's possible to do this in the plane, but if you go out of plane with these sort of twisted um, circles, then, then, uh, then there you go. There's, there's three gears, the pairwise mesh, and they all work. Um, so here's a much simpler solution. Where'd it go? So this is, I mean, okay, we're sort of cheating a different way, right? So this is translation rather than rotation, but it still has three gears that are uh, pairwise meshed with each other. And when you move any one of them, all three of them move. Uh, here's a version with four. Let's see, where did four go? Let's put four over here. So we've, we've sort of switched from uh, a kind of a C3 symmetry to a tetrahedral symmetry. Um, and then with the, the four, um, this is in some sense, the current record is five pieces. I don't know how this one with me, but five pairwise meshing gears that they're all move. I think it says either C5 or D5 symmetry, depending on how you count it. Um, okay. And, and a few more sort of moving things. I guess this is another thing to say about the medium that you choose, right? Here are these things that move. If I just showed you sort of an animation, you'd be like, yeah, sure, okay, fine, a nice animation. But if it real, really works in real life and you can play with it and it physically does what it's supposed to do, then yeah, it's real. Yeah. Okay, so what is this showing? Uh, so any geometer will tell you, what, you know, what's the correct geometry on the torus? It's flat Euclidean, right? All these donut pictures, they're not very you know, uniform. They've got like different bits of curvature all over the place. So here, this is a torus in the donut shape that really unfolds flat onto the plane. It really is flat Euclidean geometry. And, you, and once it's on the plane, you could you know, tile this out however you want. 
Uh, let's see. And on the other side, this one I've got here somewhere. Here we go. I'll uh, move this over the other side. So this is a negatively curved surface. So it's made out of triangles, and, and if you look closely, there are um, sometimes there's six triangles around a vertex, and sometimes there's seven. So this has negative curvature, and you will never be able to lay it flat on the table all at once, which, again, some people find disturbing for some reason. I don't know why. It's just math. Like, but some people don't like it. Um, and it really likes to hang, hang in saddles, and you really sort of play with it and sort of feel the curvature. Um, so I got interested in uh, expanding mechanisms, so things that get bigger. Um, so sometimes these are called auxetic mechanisms or auxetic materials. Uh, maybe you, oh yeah, there's audio on this. That's what this is. <laughs> Great. Um, so, uh, so this is maybe reminiscent of the Hoberman sphere. Maybe you've seen like, the, big, the plastic sphere that gets way bigger when you, when you go it out. Um, the Hoberman sphere is sort of a two-dimensional mechanism, as this is, right? The action is going on over the surface of the sphere. So here's a version which is really, truly three-dimensional. So here, the uh, structure here is the, the uh, molecular structure of diamond. So the carbon atoms in diamond are arranged in this way, and so you really could tile three-dimensional space um, however you want. So I guess I've got a little um, part of that here so that you can uh, figure out how to, oops, how to expand and contract. And uh, this was uh, what my brother saw fit to do with this. So this is a sort of grabber that's agile enough to catch a tennis ball in midair. So live on stage, first time. All right, that doesn't always work. Um, have fun. <laughs> you, you use it like a syringe and you, anyway, you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, this was a project with a uh, undergraduate. Um, let's see, this. this one's over here. So this is sort of more sort of things to do with scissor linkages. Um, this one was inspired by a picture of Thurston's in, in a hyperbolic geometry textbook. And it's, well, I don't know, it's, it's a different way to do, um, to do scissor linkages that has interesting properties. And here's a, here's a different one. You can, you can see there's this sort of self-similarity thing going on here. Uh, there's an interesting little mathematical problem what are the sort of different ratios of, of lengths of arms that will make this move? Uh, there are certainly some things you can do that will, it will just seize up. Uh, let's see. Oh, expanding stuff. So this is based on uh, Buckminster Fuller's jitterbug. So uh, Buckminster Fuller is maybe best known as uh, a popularizer of geodesic domes, but he was very interested in geometry and transformation in general. Um, we added the gears that sort of stabilizes this and, and makes it work better. Let's see, do I have this out somewhere? I think it's over there. Um, there we go. Um, more gears, so these, uh, this is a pair of gears that are attached together, but there's no axles and there's no frame. So here, here I'll prove it. This is the same sort of thing. Um, and you can see we're passing the screwdriver through them. There's nothing holding them together. Yeah. Don't let the, don't let the person <laughs> you hold on. Good plan. Thanks, Jada. Um, and so this was, uh, the, the, the reason for this is that I wanted to make this sort of, I call this braiding gears. There are three gears that are always attached together, but the order in which they're attached doesn't always, it can change, right? So sometimes, uh, let's see, purple is in the middle, and then blue is in the middle, and then red is in the middle. Here's another puzzle. How did I make this video? It just goes on forever. Where did I, did I just perfectly get it to loop? Anyway. <laughs> Am I going to tell you? Uh, sure. So uh, I did it a lot, and I got it very close, and I fade between the two when the hands are moving quickly, and you can't tell. So <laughs> yeah, there's some video trickery going on as well. Um, oh, this is a fun one. So this is the net of a cube that folds up into a cube and it has one degree of freedom. There's, it, 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 there's nothing else you can do, right? It, it's, uh, so, I mean, one of the, the, the ideas is like it's just on the table and you pick it up and it automatically makes a, a cube and you sort of have no choice. Um, 
Right now I'm trying to do this with the icosahedron, which is difficult because the icosahedron has many, many, many more faces. And so the, 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 the torque has to make its way across a much larger uh, distance. And anyway, it really starts getting into engineering problems. Um, more sort of expanding things. This is one's based on the rack and pinion instead of uh, lattices. Um, and another sort of same pieces, but has a very different behavior. So all right, some, something confusing going on here. Uh, anyway, lots of stuff. Oh, yeah, this is another recent one. So, uh, so what is this? So there are many kinds of gears where you have two rotations that are sort of act, interacting with each other. Um, and sometimes you see two translations going interacting with each other. This is, as far as I know, the first example where there are two screw motions that are interacting with each other across the gear. Now, why has nobody made this before? Probably because it's no good for transferring force or doing anything useful, but again, not important. We're pure mathematicians, right? We just make stuff up and see what happens, and it doesn't matter if it's not useful. It's not the point. What do you mean commute? I don't think they can. I think, I think two screw motions that commute have to, be, have to share the same axis. So. Yeah. I, and that makes it more difficult to sort of make larger structures with more of them, because when you start combining, com composing screw motions, things go crazy, and it's, it's hard to sort of control. Um, let's see. This is a, uh, a puzzle. Oh, hello. This is a puzzle. So there's this green thing that's inside of this purple maze. And uh, what this is doing is illustrating holonomy. So, so you see. At the start, right, the, it's sort of got its, it's in its home. Its arm is in this little holder. And then I take it around this, this uh, triangle, and it comes back rotated by 90 degrees, and it no longer fits in. And so here, you, you have to use holonomy to move around and, and try and solve the puzzle. And maybe you can see these pegs here. Those interact with the arms and mean that you can't do certain things that you would like to do. Um, here's the same sort of thing on a dodecahedron. Um, so this time, when I move this thing around a, uh, a pentagon, it gets rotated by 60 degrees, which is always like initially confusing, right? It's a pentagon. How come I get rotated by a sixth of a turn? Anybody know the answer? The answer is gas Binet and the area and the rotation. And, and anyway, I, I can tell you later. Um, and here's the same thing on a negatively curved surface. So now holonomy is going to turn you the opposite way than it does on a positively curved surface. So when I go around this pentagon, I get turned the other way. And anyway, um, this one is not so fun to play with. I didn't end up making this into a puzzle because it's kind of fiddly, right? It's like uh, also the um, so so the spherical ones. You can describe the set of orientations of the piece using SO3. Um, which, and you can use quaternions and, and sort of calculate things on computer and try and find, um, uh, and try and find mazes. Uh, if you want to do something similar on this, you can't use SO3 because you need to use some quotient of some hyperbolic group or something, and it seemed hard and difficult, and again, it wasn't so fun to play with, so I didn't end up pursuing it, but you, you can imagine that there's, there's some other things to do here um, to put this on computer and understand how the, the different rotations are happening. Uh, here's a version of the, uh, the dodecahedral, one of these, where um, the, rather than having pegs and, and arms to stop you, now you just have lots and lots and lots of tiles, and they get in each other's way. So this is sort of similar to the 15 puzzle, you know, where you slide the tiles around, and they get mixed up, and you have to get them back in the same place. Uh, I call this continental drift puzzle, because, you know, the continents sort of slide around on the Earth, and, and you have to get them back in the correct place and with the correct rotation, which is not so easy. Um, oh yeah, I got uh, I got into some optical illusions. So um, this, of course, this is an impossible triangle. Right? How did I do this? It's real, right? Um, so that's how I did it. Um, there's a cheat, but you know, if you line the camera really carefully, it's hard to tell where the cheat is. Um, here's another one. This is a fun one for knot theorists. Looks like a simple trefoil knot, right? Uh, it's not. Uh, there's some cheat going on there. Um, here's another one. This. On the left, it looks like it's the unknot. It's just a figure eight. Um, but you can see in the mirror that it's actually this, this uh, more complicated knot. And here I'm going to turn it so that the mirror image looks like 
V on not, and in the sort of prime version, I guess, you, you can see that it's not it. Oh, and I, and I also got into, I, I was trying to make a real life fractal zoom, right? You, you know, there were all these zooms into the Mandelbrot set, but they're always computer generated. Can you do it in real life? And it turns out you have to move the camera in order to make this work, right? You can't use the zoom, the zoom you can't use the zoom on your lens because it's the wrong kind of operation. It doesn't work. You have to actually physically move the camera. Oh, and here's a rotating version just, just for the hell of it. Um, and here's the version with the laser, again, just because I could <laughs> and it looked cool. Um, OK, so I've shown you a whole, whole bunch of stuff, but any educator will tell you that it's much more effective to do it than to watch somebody else do it. So I have a 3D printing lab in the math department at Oklahoma State. And, um, and I teach a course. It's a sort of project-based course where the, the students, the undergraduates, learn how to use 3D printers and, and how to use the software and design things. This is the homework from week three. And the homework is like, find a cool parametric curve on the internet and make it, right? And, and sort of generate it and print it out. And, and uh, yeah, they get into all kinds of interesting trouble. It's a project-based course. They, you know, they're making sort of mathematical art, sort of, this is the Menger sponge. This is to do with um, um, the sunflower spiral or pine cones, right? This sort of arrangement of the, uh, the nodes on a pine cone. Um, stuff to do with polyhedra, some other kind of fractal. Um, lots of cool projects. This one's to do with, um, I'm forgetting which, what it is, Kepler's laws of motion for the orbits. So one of the laws is the equal area of the ellipse is swept out in equal time. And so this is like a little bathtub where you fill it up and you can empty them out and see that they're the same, same volume. And the really fun thing here is that there's no nice parameterization of this. Right? You've got to get into like Taylor series or something in order to actually calculate this. And the student only found out about this after they'd already committed to the project. So this is the ideal, right? You want to do this thing and then you discover that the math that you've been taught so far is not up to, this, up to scratch of solving the problem. And in the real world, you have to solve problems some other way. So. Um, oh, yeah, and this was a real cool example of uh, Fourier series. So, um, this is increasing number of terms of a sawtooth curve and um, the square wave curve. And you, know, you can see all of these properties of the, um, the Fourier series. Uh, this is the same sort of thing for some variant of a Weierstrass function. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, and this was from uh, this, this past spring. Somebody made a Hoberman sphere um, in, as their, their final project. So I was very impressed. Uh, getting hinges to work is sort of tricky, and getting the geometry to work is not obvious and so on. And this is just a great quote from George Hart. Um, the more math you know, the more stuff you can make. Uh, true. Um, if, you, if you like making stuff, I encourage people to make stuff. OK, so, um, uh, so, I've got, uh, so th that was all 3D printing. I'm going to quickly say a little bit about sort of virtual reality stuff, and then I'm going to finish with a third medium, which is spherical video. So I'll show you that in a second. So I'll kind of skip through some of this VR stuff. So, so this is a virtual reality hyperbolic space. Um, illustration, and so I'm walking around a square in the real world, but I end up walking around a pentagon in, in hyperbolic space, right? The movements that I'm doing in, in real Euclidean space are translated sort of instantaneously into isometries in H3, and, uh, and holonomy shows up again, right? I'm, I'm back where I started in the real world, but I need to go one further side of the pentagon to get back where I back where I started in uh, the hyperbolic space. Um, so since then, uh, we've done a whole bunch of uh, more work with different geometries. So we've been sort of, um, I guess, uh, 2019 through to 2022 or so, we were working on uh, doing all eight of the Thurston geometries in virtual reality. So this is just Euclidean space. So yeah, sure, not so interesting, fine. Uh, this is... Uh, three-dimensional spherical space, what it looks like from the inside. Um, this one is uh, two-dimensional spherical space in one, it, two, of the, two of the dimensions are spherical space and then there's one dimension which is Euclidean. Um, you get these sort of weird mirage things going off on the sides, right? Whereas there's strange things happen when you get far enough away that geodesics, geodesics start converging in some of these uh, positively curved spaces. So weird stuff happens. And then you get to the last three, you know, nil and sol and all of those weird things. And again, 
terrifying things happen in the, in the distance that you don't want to know about. Um, and this one's Sol. And so we're working on some videos sort of going through and explaining all of these things. Oh, and here we're back inside of Euclidean space, except that the space itself is getting operated on by a Dane twist. I'm not sure if that's pleasant to be inside of or not, but that's what it looks like when the, the geodesics are getting messed with. Um, okay, spherical video. So, um, so here's a video. Um, we don't need audio yet, but we'll, we'll need audio at some point, uh, relatively soon. So this is a video of me juggling with some friends on uh, Stanford campus. And uh, I'm showing you this in the, the sort of app that comes with the camera. And I can just sort of turn around and look in all directions. Right? You can see there's a light up here in the ceiling. And you can see there's a tripod down here. And uh, so the way this works is the, the camera has a lens on either side, a very wide angle lens that actually sees more than 180 degrees. And so then what it does is the software sort of stitches together the two views and you get the entire sphere of data around you. Now, um, let's see. Now, anytime uh, you're dealing with sort of video or photographs or whatever, in, on your computer, the image is a rectangle, right? So here's this uh, same video, but this is what's stored. If you just look at it on your hard drive, Rather than looking it in the app properly, you'll see this. And this is the uh, equirectangular projection. So this is just, uh, across here is the, um, you know, that's the equator of the camera. And then there's South Pole and North Pole. You can see down here, this is the, the tripod that's underneath us. And then that was the light that was above us there. So I got interested in this uh, technology, uh, thinking about the kind of transformations you want to do to uh, a spherical image or a spherical video. So if you think about like a flat photograph or a flat image, if you want to zoom in on something, it's easy, right? You just scale it up and you crop in the sides. Well, what are you supposed to do on a sphere if you want to zoom in on some part? There's no cropping, right? The image is a closed manifold. There's no boundary. Like cropping doesn't make any sense. So what is the right, what is the right way to try and zoom in on something? Um, so the answer, I think, is to view this, this sphere of data as the Riemann sphere. And then you want to do conformal transformations to the Riemann sphere. And the thing that's nice about conformal transformations is that it doesn't sort of distort things. It doesn't shear things. The only kind of distortion is just scaling and maybe rotation. And so people's faces still look reasonable after you do that. And so you're not sort of distorting people's faces. So this is uh, that same video, but uh, pulled back by uh, the function z goes to z squared. And so that doubles up the everything in the scene and scales them down and everything looks nice. It's a conformal transformation. So if you really want to do a juggling pattern with six people, but only three people show up, if you have the right symmetry and you can sort of do some trickery here, then you can make it look like you did this pattern with six people, even though there's only three people left. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, Jadav, if you could uh, put the phone next to the, sorry, the, the, the audio is kind of janky here, but we're, we're going to try and make it work. So. A past version of me. So, as I was saying, my name is Henry Segerman. This is a spherical droster video. So, you're sort of slowly zooming this way, or rather the frame here is coming over you this way, and over there there's a sort of weird pedal portal in the middle of my apartment. This is the future, so there's future versions of me over there, um, and this is the past. Uh, so, I'll hand you off to a past version of me uh, to explain again what's going on. A pass version of me. So, as I was saying, my name is Henry Segerman. This is a spherical droster video. So, okay, so, so there's some things going on here. Let me try and explain what's going on. So, uh, so this is the effect of doing, um, I guess, just a scaling transformation to the. Okay, so take the Riemann sphere, stereolite projected onto the complex plane, scale around the origin, wrap it back up. That's what this is except uh, I guess we're scaling away from this. So I guess maybe this is zero and this is infinity, something like that, right? You have to sort of rotate things around and make it work. So that's what zoom should be, right? It's the conformal transformation that makes things bigger. It also makes the things behind you smaller, but I mean, what did you expect, right? It's got to do something like that. And it has this it's sort of uncanny sense of motion rather than zooming. It feels like you're moving. And so I'm sort of, 
exploiting that here. Maybe you can just, just about see. It's a little hard to see on this because uh, the screen's so bright. There's a tripod down here. Maybe you can just barely see the tripod. The tripod is not moving. The camera is not moving. All that's happening is that we're doing this, this conformal transformation to the, to the video. And then, of course, you know, I'm doing some trickery, right? I'm, I'm green screening in a sense. I just cut out this panel for the window and I pasted in the same image, but 30 seconds into the future or the past or whatever it was. And that's, that's where this, this all comes from. Um, okay, so there's, there's one other thing that I want to show you. Um, and we'll need the audio again. This was joint work with Vi Hart, who hasn't been so active on YouTube recently, but she used to do a lot of like really cool um, YouTube stuff. So this is about four minutes long. I'll just let it play and then I'll say a few words and then I'll, then I'll be done. So there's a lot going on there. Um, let me point out a few things that maybe you noticed. Well, okay, first of all, the transformation here is just Z goes to Z cubed, right? That's how we get this tripled up piano. The camera is right above uh, this key in real life, 
and then it gets tripled up. Do not, under any circumstances, press this key. The universe will <laughs> explode or something. Um, so, so you'll notice there's, there's always three copies of Vi, but there are only two copies of me. Where did the third me go? Um, also, let's look at the, let's see. There's the sheet music. So Vi picks up the sheet music. She plays a couple of notes here. She passes it to me. I pass it back to her through the piano, for some reason, whatever. She puts it down on the, the music stand. She plays a couple of notes. She picks up a hammer, again, who knows why. And then she picks up the, the sheet music. There's only one copy of the sheet music. How is that possible? OK, so there, there's, a, there's a bit of a mystery. So yes, um, there's a lot of video editing going on here. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, the musical um, object here is the round where usually you've got three different singers that are singing the same thing off, off set in time. Here it's Vi singing all three parts, sort of recombined through the magic of video editing, but we're also doing a visual version of uh, Round as well. If you're interested in sort of the, the choreography of uh, you know, the te technology behind how we did this, there's, um, there's lots of details on uh, a YouTube video. Uh, the, the, the piece is called uh, Piece for Triple Piano, P-E-A-C-E, -E, so you can look it up on YouTube. Okay, uh, that's my talk. So I've got a book. You could buy it if you want. Um, I'm also not on Twitter anymore. Neither should you, by the way, be on Twitter, but I'm on other things, Instagram, something like that. That's my YouTube. Sorry, that's my website. Anyway, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Henry, for a great talk, uh, very thought-provoking. Uh, questions and comments, if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll come over to you for the...